Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Folio, a new library services platform built for innovation, which is sponsored by EBSCO. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment uh, and point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you should see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. Please use the Q&A panel to submit questions to our panelists. At the end of the presentation, we'll take a few minutes to answer your questions, so please do submit them throughout. If you experience any technical difficulties, please use the chat panel to let me know, and I'll troubleshoot the issue with you privately. You'll also notice that we are uh, using the hashtag FolioACRL during and after this event. So if you're like me and you've always got another screen handy, feel free to shout out to us in the Twitterverse using Folio ACRL. You can find Choice on Twitter at Choice underscore Reviews and the folks from Folio at Folio underscore LSP. Also note that we are recording today's program and we'll send out a follow-up email to everyone who registered for the webinar. Uh, the email will have key links to the Folio community resources and a link to the recording. Look for that sometime this afternoon or tomorrow morning at the latest. And now, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for today. Harry Kaplanian is the Senior Director, Product Management at EBSCO, and Peter Murray is the Open Source Community Advocate at Index Data. So at this point, we are ready to get started, and I will turn the floor over to you, Harry. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, this is Harry, and I'm going to jump right in. So academic libraries are all facing times of unprecedented challenge and change. And really, many industries are as well and have been for quite some time. Um, as libraries, uh, we're facing changes from the organization that we belong to or are here to serve. There's been lots of change and innovation that goes on there. The users that we serve um, have changed rather dramatically over the years as well, too, in terms of what their expectations are, the type of services they expect from libraries. And then as libraries, we also face this challenge of really having to prove our value, our worth to the greater organization as well. And add on top of that, the types of content, the media, everything else that we're dealing with has changed really rather dramatically over, you know, really quite a few years now. Yet, when we take a look at all the systems that are in place that we work with today, uh, these, frankly, fairly old management systems, library management systems, we've really been using the same systems for 20 years, in some cases, really 30 years or so. The UIs may have changed. You know, there have been definite improvements, feature add-ons, and what have you. But there's really been no innovation whatsoever. And when you take a look around and see what's going on, you know, in other industries out there worldwide, um, you know, in those industries where, you know, the installed base fail to innovate, they really fail to exist after a period of time. There's plenty of organizations that have outright just disappeared. And so in the world of libraries, we really don't want to be in that situation. It's a dangerous place to be, and we don't want to be there. And so, you know, the idea of innovation has really moved from a consideration to absolute necessity. We have to innovate. It's absolutely critical to what we do. Now, when we look around at those industries where we have seen lots of substantial change and positive change, uh, one of the things that really seems to be impacting or changing the world, changing businesses and industries, are really these platforms or service platforms that are moving into play. And 
you know, thinking about this and spending a little bit of time, obviously, you know, there's your iPhone um, or your Android device, and that's been changing rather dramatically for the last 10 years or so. But, but thinking about something more recent, um, especially in terms of what's going on in the home, um, of course, Amazon released this device called EBSCO, excuse me, called Echo <laughs> a few years ago. And, um, you know, the Echo is basically a speaker and a microphone connected to the Internet, connected to a platform. The real innovation that comes here is that Amazon essentially released what amounts to probably the most advanced speech recognition we've seen in a good number of years, at least that's publicly and commercially available. And then on top of it, they created this platform, a service platform. And, of course, as Echo was first released, it was rather limited in terms of features and functionality that it could provide. Basically, you could talk to it, find out what the weather is like or what the weather is going to be, ask it to play some music, and, you know, it really didn't go much further than that. But where Amazon really innovated is they created this platform called Alexa, and platform has this ability to learn skills. And skills are really interesting because anyone can write a skill, whether it be an individual, other vendors, what have you. And so you end up in this situation where really enormous amounts of innovation are happening because really Alexa is, lear is learning new skills. And at last count, there are over 3,000 of these. And so for instance, you have vendors like Philips coming in and hooking in their automated lighting systems. You've got Nest with the thermostats that can plug in into this platform. You've got the local pizza parlor delivery down the street um, that's actually able to plug into this platform as well. And what's great about this is Amazon had to deliver in two key areas, that platform and voice recognition. But to be truthful, if Amazon decided to get into the pizza business, I don't think I'd order pizza from them because I don't think it'd be any good. I don't trust them to be controlling the temperature inside my home, and I really have a hard time believing they have what's needed to build state-of-the-art lighting systems. Yet, these other vendors have come together, plugged into this platform, and you've got enormous amounts of innovation happening here, but it's happening because this platform allows individuals and vendors to focus on their strengths, those key areas that they're great at, to continue to drive and do the best that they can absolutely do, plug into this platform, and now allow complete new ways for all these different systems to interoperate. And to top it all off, they now get a whole new UI, voice recognition, that frankly none of these vendors would ever be able to provide. And really, that's a modern, great, really fantastic example of what a true platform can do. Now, of course, in the library industry, um, you know, we're in this state where we have library service platforms. And it's interesting because when you look at what is a library service platform today and what it provides, you end up with a monolithic code base, more often than not based on 10, 20, sometimes 30-year-old technology. The code base is closed. It's very limited in terms of APIs, only the few key and interesting areas that the vendor allows to be made available. And then to top it all off, we have a vendor that's going in and trying to basically take over or represent every workflow that might exist in your library, and they're trying to do it all on their own. And so we end up with a platform that really isn't providing any innovation, and to top it all off is in many ways locking us into a system that they provide and really severely limiting our choice in terms of being able to pick and choose the tools that best suit our needs in our organization, in our library. And so what I'm trying to say here is I don't believe what we're calling library service platforms today are actually service platforms, or at least not in terms of what we see being used out there in industry today. So when we talk about this thing called folio, um, 
Folio is built and based on multiple concepts, one of the key ones being open source. Um, the other one, of course, being that, well, which is part of open source, every aspect of the code should be available for anyone to look at, to work with, to play with. And it's built on top of this idea of Okapi, which is an API gateway, which really is the fundamental key communication layer that makes up Folio. It's how apps communicate. Um, normally in this chart, you'd also be seeing another layer here, which is the UI toolkit, which we call Stripes. But to simplify this diagram, that's not part of this picture, and we can talk about that in a little bit as well. Now, of course, Okapi on its own can't do much unless other things plug into it. And so as this rolls out, we recognize, of course, that for a library to adopt this, there needs to be some basic functionality that libraries expect. And so, for instance, it will roll out with an open source acquisitions application that is able to plug in here. Um, it will roll out with a resource management application as well. And we use the word resource management, management not ERM or print resource management or cataloging, because really, when we talk about resource management, it really should not matter what type of resources the library is trying to make available to its users. You should be able to manage them all, and you should not have to deal with multiple systems to deal with all of that. Um, we use circulation here, at least in this diagram. That name should probably change as well, because you're not only trying, of course, to provide access to physical content, but electronic content as well. But of course, what we expect to plug into this as well is authentication services as well. Um, that we want to make sure we're able to protect your users and your staff. And there are plenty of good systems out there, for instance, based on Shibboleth, Open Athens, what have you, that should be able to plug in and communicate with this system. And of course, SSO, which gives us that protection, but also giving us the ability to have a single sign-on we should not have users having to sign in multiple times to get work done within the library. It really just creates barriers to what our users are trying to do. Um, discovery, we believe in choice, and so you should be able to select any discovery service you choose. This platform should be open to any discovery service to plug in and to make use of the resources that are available. Selection, um, or maybe some might call this storefronts, uh, you should be able to integrate any of the vendors that you work with in terms of securing access to content. This should be open for all of them to plug into. Interlibrary loan systems, of course, there are multiples, and it's a key part of what goes on in the library, and in many ways really a key part of what we might call circulation of all materials within the library. Institutional repositories, again, a key part of the collection. Uh, the learning management system that exists on campus, we absolutely need to be plugged into that. And of course, any reporting systems that may exist as well, and ultimately you should be able to choose that as well. When we look at all these different systems that we fully expect and plan on plugging into Folio and the Okapi Gateway, you know, this picture starts to form really of the first time where we're having applications that are built by multiple vendors, organizations, libraries, and individuals that are able to plug into the system and start to communicate in ways that they never have before, which certainly provides some really interesting benefits when you think about it. Um, we are now able, in this case, to log usage down to the individual level in terms of what's going on, but not just in the traditional catalog, but also e-resource management, institutional repositories, electronic packages, what have you. And of course, we're able to take a look at what impact that has, for instance, on grades based on the learning management system. But to top it all off through SSO, not only we're we able to get this information down to an individual level, but we're able to do it in a way that absolutely protects the personally identifiable information of that user. So we can do all of this while protecting the user, which is really great. And then we can actually take this a little bit further. No modern system today would be useful without a knowledge base. Um, that's something we have, I think, learned over the last 10 years. Um, but what's interesting, when you look at systems that exist today, there seems to be an assumption 
that a single organization can not only provide all these tools, but then provide that single ultimate knowledge base that should be able to represent every piece of content that a library might be interested in. And I think all of us know that's not necessarily the case, and it's incredibly hard to do. And we don't believe there's anyone actually doing this successfully, and we don't think there can be. And when you think about it, the idea of tying an organization to a single knowledge base is also very limiting. So for Folio, really the concept moving forward is it should be able to connect and deal with multiple knowledge bases simultaneously. So you should be able to connect and maintain a knowledge base that represents the best that's out there or as far as print. You should be able to do it for all your e-packages as well. But then really when you think about institutional repositories, those are really a knowledge base as well, so that should be able to plug in. But then you start to also think about union catalogs or national catalogs as well. And these are knowledge bases that need to plug in and become integral of this system as well. And of course, as we pull all of this together, there's interesting analytics and certainly analytics packages out there that need to plug in. And then when you also start to think about this now, a system built upon a communication gateway with all these different applications that are communicating, working with multiple knowledge bases, providing the best access, the best metadata, the content that your library needs to take advantage of, it starts to provide some really interesting possibilities for linked data as well. Because all of a sudden we're cataloging really by reference and maybe not so much copy cataloging anymore. There's all sorts of knowledge bases that we're able to gain access and create these links to different aspects of knowledge and take advantage of it. So this isn't an ambitious project, and for any project, successful project, of course, we need a roadmap. We need a plan. How do we get from point A from point B? We absolutely have that vision, but how do we make it there? And so for 2016, um, we had a goal, and our goal was to support multi-team independent application development. Um, one of the things I mentioned just briefly a little while ago is that we find it hard to believe that a single organization or a single vendor can provide great service for everything that a library needs, provides the applications, the feature sets, the knowledge bases that every library needs. Um, it just, it can't happen. And to take that a little bit further, we just don't believe a single organization out there today has the resources to successfully build all of that. And so for Folio to be successful, to build that community of people, libraries, and organizations, we need to be in a place where we can support really multi-team, independent application development. Um, we need to actively encourage and support other external organizations by giving them the ability to build the apps that they need to plug into this system. And so to that end, really 2016 focused on the core, which is Okapi, the gateway, which is the communication layer. And the first version of that was actually released the middle of 2016, and of course there have been updates ever since. And that is really fully documented. The code is fully available on GitHub. Um, uh, you can go to dev.folio.org and take a look at that. Uh, in addition, of course, we had to work out storage and frankly search as well too. And a lot of work has gone on there. And this is also really interesting from the perspective of that there's a storage subsystem, of course, that it works with for persistence but the way it's been created, in a sense, it's actually been abstracted. So in the future, you should be able to, and in fact, you can actually make an attempt at it now, it should work, you can plug in additional storage subsystems or possibly replace the one that comes out, that rolls out default with Folio as well too. And you should be able to do that without rewriting or reworking all the apps that plug into Okapi. We've been working on schema definitions and that work continues and will be ongoing. Um, when we think about this idea of a platform with many organizations plugging in with applications, 
uh, one of our goals, of course, was we'd like to be able to have a variation of this that a library can set up and configure or a vendor can set up and configure that even though these apps are created by different organizations, they should all have a very similar look and feel. It should feel like it was created by a single organization or a single vendor. And so to that end, uh, in 2016 and frankly ongoing now, there's been a lot of work going on into the UI toolkit. And that's actually out there available and documented as well at dev.folio.org. And this is a common UI layer with uh, not just UI stylistic elements, but actual controls that can be used that provide that consistent look and feel. Along those lines as well, of course, there's the UI design work as well. And so we have a team of UI designers that have been working on these different apps and in, they've been creating UI designs. And Peter, a little bit later, I believe, will show you how you can access and start to take a look and play with some of the interactive demos of how we expect this system to look. And those designs, are it's, it's all fully open source. It's fully out there available for anyone that wants to look at it, take advantage of it, and use it as well. In addition, uh, we have this concept of what we're calling an exemplar app. And when you roll out something like this or a platform like this, one of the issues, of course, we face is ramp up. And again, our goal was to get multiple independent teams out there frankly, outside of the project to be able to build applications. And so there is a certain ramp up period, ramp up time that we also need to think about. And of course, part of that is documentation, um, could possibly be training, a key part of gaining access to all the source code, which is all out there, but really we need great sample code. And so this exemplar app is what we believe represents an ideal application that shows how someone can take advantage of the UI toolkit, Stripes, how they can take advantage of Okapi and the storage subsystems and tie their business logic into that to build an application. And so developers can either take this and look at it as an example and go build their own, or they can actually take the source code because it's out there and available and start to morph it and turn it into applications of their own. Our other goal for 2016, which really started near the end of 2016, is the formation of SIGs, our special interest groups as well. And those continue to form. We, uh, we do not believe that a service like this can be built in a vacuum. Um, we absolutely believe we need to spend as much time as possible with librarians, um, with consortia, um, with vendors as well, trying to understand the needs. And as you can imagine, as we build and develop and work on the UI designs, the UI design work goes hand in hand with discussions with these SIGs, but also the developers and all of us ourselves, as we get through all of this, there are just countless questions that we come up with um, that we need answers to, we need recommendations for. And for that, we go to the community and the key part of that community are the special interest groups. And again, Peter will talk about that a little bit later. So starting in first quarter of 2017, um, or 2016, what do we need to do to support those multiple independent teams? Now our goal is starting to move, how do we onboard these multiple independent teams to get the different apps built? And so uh, part of the UI design work that started in 2016 and that continues to go on is to get us to the point where we can almost uh, create what amounts to packages that represent these are the features and functionality that we need to create this working app, but on top of it, this is the UI design and how we expect it to look and work as well. And this is everything that we believe is needed to build this application. And of course, we have teams that are working on that now. We have libraries that are starting to ramp up and get involved as well as other vendors. And so the idea is we should be able to turn these over out to the community and the community can start to create these as well, not just us. And since all of these are open source, even if we just roll out an initial version or a first version, all that code is publicly available. So it's available for libraries, vendors, and individuals to go out there and to start to modify, enhance, and ideally even create multiple versions of some of these so they can cater to specific 
situations to specific libraries or library groups. So the apps that we're tr um, trying to ramp up here in the first quarter, uh, circulation, um, of course, it's hard to circulate if you don't have anything to circulate. So resource management and resource management, meaning print, E, and everything else. And of course, user management, the ability, of course, to create users in the system, to manage users, and to assign rights to those users, meaning what applications do they get access to, what features do they have access to, and of course, when we talk about circulation, what can they circulate, how often, when, fines, everything else. And of course, to get resource management working properly, we need to get the first of the knowledge bases integrated as well. And so we can start to work all this out. And of course, additional UI design work for these that we're trying to start up, but also for any applications that we plan to start up in the following quarters as well. April, June, um, additional applications. We expect to start up acquisitions. Uh, system operations and management. So the system is really designed from the start to be able to support the idea or concepts behind consortia, which really means multi-tenancy. And so the system is designed today, it does have features already built in where an organization can create multiple libraries, configure each of those libraries, and of course we're starting work on creating the relationships between those libraries as well. So not only can vendors take advantage of this, but consortia and libraries as well, because it's all out there and available as open source. Of course, around this time, we expect to start the integration of discovery services as well. Moving forward, 2017, uh, the idea of a marketplace of some type. Uh, we expect that libraries will want to be able to pick and choose the applications that they're able to use as part of Folio, um, not be forced into using everything that one vendor creates, but ideally pick and choose, and in some cases, even providing choice among similar applications. And some sort of a process we'll be working on as well to try and make sure, of course, that as you download, set up, or install something, that you can have a reasonable expectation, of course, that it'll work and interoperate. Also around the end of the year is when we expect to see some of the initial uh, migrations or the initial really um, development partners, libraries, start to adopt and start to migrate data on the systems and work with us to start to get it live. And then of course, finally in 2018 is where we expect to see multiple vendors out there providing hosting and support services for Folio as well. It's all open source, and one of the benefits of open source, of course, is if you're not happy with a vendor that you've selected to help you out, well, you should be free to do it yourself, to modify the code yourself, or even better, go out and select another vendor that you think can better cater to your needs. And so we fully expect a thriving market in that case. And um, that's essentially our roadmap leading into 2018. So, you know, we've talked quite a bit about this idea of a services platform. We've talked quite a bit about interoperability. We've spoken a lot about choice and open source and the benefits that all of this provides to you. And really the critical need for innovation in the library. And so I guess my parting or my last question, you know, to all of you is if you can to really sit down and spend some time thinking and imagining the possibilities of what might be out there. You know, when Apple rolled out the first iPhone or when Amazon, of course, rolled out the Echo um, or when the first Android devices were out there, right, the iPhone released with very basic functionality, basically allowing you to make calls and do some texting. The real interesting and innovation happened by that active community of other vendors and other people solving problems. Um, in the case of my phone, I very rarely call someone on it. I'm really using it for almost all those other neat and interesting things, problems that are being solved. And so if you had a platform like that that basically provided unlimited possibilities, what apps would you like to see in your library? And so we'd like you to take that hashtag, uh, Folio Builds, and please submit your ideas and we have a contest going on. 
and uh, we will be giving away a Folio smart pad um, to uh, some lucky person out there. So we strongly encourage you uh, to submit your ideas. We'd like to see what you're thinking and see what we can do to get those done and get it accomplished. And I believe at this point, um, I'm, it's, it's time for Peter to take over. Great. So Peter, there you go. Um, thank you, uh, Harry. Yes. Um, so I'm going to dig into a, a few more details about the project, um, starting with this notion of user-centered design. From Folio's early days, we knew we wanted a project where user experience drove the system design. Uh, these are three graphics uh, describing at a uh, high level some of the ways that software can be developed. Uh, they're taken from a presentation that Philip Jacobson did in August of last year that outlined the user experience design process for Folio. So historically, software is designed uh, starting with uh, strategy decisions, then moving to software development, then getting to the user interface, then getting the user interface design experts involved. Um, at the point where the user interface designers get involved, uh, much of the functionality of the system is baked in. Uh, and so the only thing that is left is, uh, as Philip put it, uh, decoration, uh, changing the colors or, or rearranging the buttons on the screen. Uh, for a technologist like me who earned their bachelor's degrees uh, in the early 1990s, uh, this looks normal and, and I know it's not a great process. Uh, a more user-centered design approach is in the middle where the user experience process and the software coding process are swapped. Uh, conceptually, though, this is still a linear pipeline, um, and the design approach we're taking with Folio is at the bottom by iterating in a loop between strategy development and user experience exploration and software development, uh, we take advantage of the best that each step can offer. Um, in the early development stages of Folio, where we are now, uh, many of the strategic development decisions are well in hand. Uh, we know the kinds of library workflows uh, that the software will need to support. Uh, and the subject matter experts are working with the user interface, user experience design now. Um, the subject matter experts are working on these workflows uh, through the Folio special interest groups, uh, and I'll be talking about uh, those interest groups in a few minutes. We fully expect, though, that the strategic discussions will revive anew um, with thoughts about how the platform can be used to address library services we haven't envisioned yet. Uh, and so I'd like to take you through a tour of the prototype of the Folio interface. Uh, the URL that you're going to want to copy here is the second one. Uh, discuss.folio.org uh, slash t slash 162. Uh, that's a post on the Folio Discuss site that will lead you to the online prototype, which is the first URL here, uh, as well as to the recorded webinar from Philip that discusses the user-centered design approach. Uh, that's the presentation from which I pulled the diagrams on the previous slide. Uh, I believe this design philosophy is at the heart of what we're doing uh, and that everything else, uh, the concept of apps on a platform, uh, buzzword, buzzwords like microservices and RESTful interfaces uh, and so forth, uh, everything else comes from that user experience design and concept. Uh, 
so if you're interested in hearing more about this approach, I encourage you to review that recording. I'm going to switch now from the slides to a uh, Google um, browser. Uh, and as I do that, I want to uh, set some expectations for what we're going to see. Um, the prototype looks like a fully functional system. Uh, and in fact, some of the interactions might convince you that there's a, a live system behind it. Uh, in reality, the interaction is following a, a scripted pattern uh, to give the subject matter experts a sense of what a real system will look like. Uh, for instance, I'm going to click on Anado, uh, but the system takes me to a sign-on of Gildo. That's what it was scripted to do. Uh, another click fills in the password. Um, another click uh, selects the, uh, the uh, desk, particular desk location that we're at, and we drop into the prototype of the user's app. Uh, Peter? So, yes. Peter, this is Mark. It, we're having a bit of difficulty seeing your screen right now. It looks like you've got um, some hash marks as opposed to the, the, the actual browser. Um, if you could perhaps okay. close out um, this share and um, share and then try again. Yeah, there we Let's go. Let's see. How's that? That is much better. Great. Okay, very good. Uh, don't worry, you haven't missed anything. It's it's uh, this is this is where it gets interesting from here on out. Um, so a few words about Folio's technology. Uh, it's what's known as a single uh, page web application. Uh, so similar to Google Apps and Facebook, uh, it uses a, a typical web browser and modern web technologies that makes it appear like an application running on your desktop. Um, in the upper left corner uh, up here, uh, we have the app that we're now in and some breadcrumbs that give you a, a context of what we see on the screen. Uh, further across the screen, we see a, a list of apps that have been run recently. Uh, and then some icons that are functionality of the platform itself. Uh, the main part of the screen is filled with the user's app. Uh, over here, uh, there's a, a search box and some filters we can use to uh, narrow down based on keywords or other attributes. Uh, the second panel is uh, the list of users that, that match those filters, uh, and you can choose uh, what you want to see um, by uh, pulling down this uh, three-dot menu, uh, uh, see what you want to show on the list, uh, select, or deselect, batch edit, and so forth. Uh, the main part of this, uh, main panel here on the right contains uh, the user information, uh, and it starts with uh, these headings and uh, shortcut keys uh, that will allow you to scroll to a particular location. Now, this is a part of the prototype, obviously, that is under development, uh, so most of what you see on uh, the, the rest of the system uh, is, uh, is just filler for now. Uh, all record types in the system have the ability to add notes uh, and triggers that uh, cause things to happen on the record. Uh, in this case, a note for someone to look at the record uh, and a trigger for the next time uh, the uh, patron ID is scanned at the service desk. Uh, we can also add this uh, record to uh, one or more lists of uh, bookmarks uh, within the platform using this bookmark icon. Uh, there isn't anything in the prototype yet to show what you can do with bookmark records, uh, but we expect to define that functionality for exporting 
and batch updating records uh, and bookmark lists. There's also the conceptual beginnings of a cataloging app uh, and a circulation app. Uh, but the special interest groups have not done much work in this area. Uh, the current development focus, as Harry was, was describing, uh, is a, a thin thread of functionality uh, related to the users app that we just saw. Uh, this thin thread is, is meant to demonstrate uh, all of the stages of development uh, from the data storage later through the business logic and out to the browser and the user interface. Um, and that's coming along quite nicely. It won't be much longer uh, before we can make a, a public demonstration of a, a real folio system uh, in the browser. Some of the early concepts, uh, early conceptual work involves around workflow tasks uh, in this automation app. Uh, if you've used something like If This Then That or uh, Zapier on the web uh, or even the automator function in, in Mac OS, uh, this works somewhat the same way. Uh, given a trigger and a set of data uh, from either a form or uh, from either a file, or a bookmark list or something else, uh, perform a set of actions on them. And you can see uh, some of those examples on the left. So paired with this is a calendar app where you can see these automations scheduled for future dates, uh, the sync WordPress automation, uh, as well as other things like reminders, uh, this reminder cal calendar event. There is a settings app uh, where users can change their pro uh, profile details, uh, their uh, user interface uh, settings, uh, personal shortcuts, uh, or notification options. Uh, given the appropriate permissions, an administrator can uh, adjust some of the general settings across the system. Uh, organization, app permissions, authentication, and so forth. Then each app on the system has its own specific settings. Uh, the one that is most thought out at this point is, again, the users app, uh, where users with the appropriate permissions can set record templates and uh, performance groups. So back along the top here again are functions provided by the platform. Uh, we can see what automations are running in the background. Uh, we can also import files into the system uh, to be processed through an automation step or some other mechanism. Uh, the bookmark list I talked about earlier are held uh, in the platform. And from here, you would be able to decide what you want to do with uh, a bookmark list. Alerts from all of the apps in the system are here in this notification area. Uh, we also have a notion of a system-wide search. Uh, you can see it's, it's quite uh, sparse at this point, but we have that idea. We also have an idea for a split view uh, to run more than one app at a time. Uh, this one is quite controversial among the developers. Uh, it's a case where something is straightforward to prototype, uh, but actually making it work is a, a quite different matter. Right? And, and we'll see if it moves from the prototype to the live system. Uh, the final menu item here offers uh, menu choices that are specific to the user, including viewing their own profile, uh, setting preferences, switching to another user, or logging off. So that's one path through the prototype. Uh, there are other screens and functionality defined that I didn't go through, uh, and this user interface prototype is under near constant development as feedback comes in. Uh, so in a moment, I'll talk about the special interest groups as the feedback channel uh, into the user interface prototype. 
Uh, but before I leave the prototype, I, I wanted to encourage you to come back and, and play around. Uh, I gave the URL to the information about the prototype earlier, and uh, after this webinar, uh, as Mark said, you'll receive an email with that URL and others from today's uh, presentation. But if this has really grabbed your attention, you'll want to turn in, tune into next week's uh, Folio Forum webinar, uh, where Philip uh, will talk about how to clone this design and try creating your own apps. Uh, with that, though, I'm going to stop sharing and return to the presentation slides. So as I described earlier, the Folio project uses this user-centered design approach. And the place where those user-centered discussions happen is in the special interest groups, uh, or SIGs. There are four functional SIGs right now, uh, SIGs that are focused on particular functionality in the system. Uh, they're the metadata management SIG, the resource access SIG, the resource management SIG, and uh, the user management SIG. So for each of these, I'll describe a, a general focus of the SIG, uh, some of its current activities, and, and then where to go to get more information. And, and on behalf of all of the librarians and technologists involved in the Folio project now, I hope you'll find one or more of these SIGs attracts your attention, that, and that you'll want to track the progress of a SIG or two uh, or even join in the SIG's activities uh, to define the functionality needed for the Folio platform uh, and those things that you are, are dreaming about for your library. So the first one up is, is metadata management. Uh, the metadata management SIG is looking at the bibliographic data uh, that we all need and rely on. Uh, as Harry described, the, the Folio project members are, are wrapping their arms around uh, data that is bigger than the MARC record stores uh, in our current generation of, of library automation systems. Uh, he showed on, on his uh, uh, screen, his slide, uh, multiple knowledge bases. Uh, the, the metadata management SIG is, is tackling the union of bibliographic data and knowledge base data. Uh, or more, more generally, a, a unified view of the description of physical items and electronic items and, and with all of the complexity that that entails. And while this group is embracing this wide view of the kinds of metadata that will be in the system, it's also incorporating a hierarchical perspective to metadata, uh, where data can come from national libraries or consortial systems uh, as well as multiple local systems, such as institutional repositories and data management systems. Uh, this is the, the cataloging by reference that, that uh, Harry uh, mentioned. And lastly, this SIG is looking at the array of descriptive metadata formats that are being handled in libraries today. Uh, beyond AACR2 and MARC, uh, into RDA and BibFrame, as well as Dublin Core and discipline-specific formats like PB Core and FGDC. Um, creating an underlying platform where all of these pieces can work together uh, is a fascinating challenge, and the metadata management SIG is looking for deep thinkers and experienced practitioners to move this work forward. Uh, Doreen Harold from Lehigh University is the SIG convener, uh, the person that's coordinating the, act, coordinating the activities of this SIG. Uh, her contact information is on the wiki at the address here on the screen, uh, and they are in the process of setting up their regular meeting time. So uh, watch their SIG wiki space for more details. Resource access starts with traditional circulation functions, check in and check out, and all of the ancillary functions that go along with that. Uh, going beyond that, though, it also looks at facilitating access to electronic resources and resource sharing between libraries through consortial arrangements and interlibrary loan. Uh, gathering and reporting on resource usage statistics is also within uh, the resource access SIG. Uh, 
this SIG has had two meetings so far. Uh, the second one was a few hours ago, I think. Uh, and so, like other SIGs, it's in the early days of getting organized. Uh, you won't be far behind everyone else if you join in the work of the SIGs now. Uh, in the first few meetings, uh, the SIG went into more depth uh, in the prototype that I showed you earlier, uh, and the members started reviewing the relevant parts of a functional matrix uh, that was prepared last summer and fall. Uh, this SIG meets Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern U.S. time via WebEx, and you can find the connection details on the SIG website. Uh, the SIG uh, convener is Andrea Leugman from Duke University. The resource management SIG is the longest running SIG that we have. Uh, it predates the formation of the other three SIGs by several months, and, and some of its early work, uh, such as on a, a functional matrix, uh, has actually been split off into the other SIGs. Uh, its focus now is on how libraries acquire and manage resources, whether those resources are physical or electronic. Uh, as you can see from the excerpt of their purpose statement here, uh, there's a lot of nitty-gritty details about the acquisitions process. Uh, that they need to go through. The SIG has had a face-to-face -face meeting uh, in Boston last year to organize their work, uh, and more recent meetings have been working through the renewal process uh, to give Philip Jacobson, the, the person working with the UI prototype, uh, the information he needs to add acquisitions workflows to the prototype. Uh, the SIG meets uh, via WebEx on Fridays at 8.30 in the morning U.S. time, and is convened by Kristen Martin from the University of Chicago. The final SIG is user management, uh, and we're taking a more holistic view of users in the Folio platform uh, with just a subtle distinction between staff users and patrons. Uh, in Folio, they're the same type of users, and, and staff users will just have additional functionality in the system. Uh, this generated a lot of discussion over the summer in the early design stages. Uh, in the end, we thought that as a library services platform, the boundary between what library staff do and what patrons do in Folio is going to be blurry. Uh, as the Internet turns into more of a self-service orientation, uh, we envision there will be apps that provide uh, powerful functionality to patrons and that it would be more cumbersome to have, in effect, two user databases, one for patrons and one for staff. Uh, in the first few meetings, the user management SIG has been reviewing the prototype user interface and a list of fields that will be needed for each user record. Uh, the SIG meets Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern U.S. time on WebEx, and the convener is Chris Manley from Cornell University. So in addition to these for functional areas, there are some special interest groups that look across functions. Uh, that are, there are two that are active that are not listed on the screen, uh, but you can go find them on the wiki. Uh, one is uh, called the Product Council, and it is a coordinating body that reviews what is happening in the SIGs, uh, making sure that each SIG is aware of the other's work uh, to limit duplication of effort. Uh, and it also starts the formation of new SIGs when there are gaps that need to be covered. Uh, they meet on Thursdays at uh, 10 uh, a.m. via WebEx. Uh, the second one is the forum facilitators, and this group meets to plan the biweekly folio forums on topics that are of interest to the broad community. Uh, yesterday, there was a forum on the folio technical review team uh, that is chartered by Olay members. Uh, next week, uh, there is that uh, forum on how people can uh, clone the user interface prototype and use it as the basis of their own Folio apps. Uh, those of us that have been working on the system for months are excited to see what others are going to design as apps in the platform, so uh, don't miss that forum. Uh, so in addition to those two, there are some SIGs that are in the proposal stages now uh, and two that are not far along. Uh, one is the patron privacy 
uh, SIG, uh, where there's a need for effort and expertise uh, to look at how government regulations and our profession's values uh, are manifest in the folio system. The second is on internationalization. Uh, one of the really exciting parts about the folio project is the interest across the world. And, and we don't want one region's assumptions about data formats and display uh, to hinder the adoption of folio in other regions. Uh, the URLs on the screen to these two SIG proposal are to the, the two SIG proposals, uh, and you can go there for more information. Uh, other SIGs that have been suggested are accessibility and inter institutional services. Both are important, and, and the SIG formation process provides a way for communities interested in these aspects to come together and coordinate their efforts. There are undoubtedly other special interest groups that will need to be formed, uh, and if you see the need for one, the Product Council's wiki space has a lightweight process to form a special interest group. Uh, in turn, the Folio project uh, offers tools to help coordinate uh, the work of the SIGs. Uh, so this is a view of how we're organizing our communication channels in the Folio project. Uh, there's a distinction in the color of the hexagons between orange and gray, and that's meant to distinguish between primary communication tools and secondary tools. Uh, there's an important distinction because of the nature of the Folio project. Uh, which is worldwide interest, uh, full-time and part-time contributors, and a growing and an evolving project. Uh, there's another software development foundation that looks a lot like Folio, uh, and that's the Apache Foundation. Uh, the Apache Foundation is one of the oldest organizations supporting open source. Uh, it can trace its origins back to the development of some of the first web server code in the early 1990s. Uh, and their motto is, if it didn't happen on a mailing list, it didn't happen. Uh, or put another way, if a conversation or decision didn't happen on a forum with some permanence that everyone has access to, then it doesn't count. Uh, we have a variation on this motto in the Folio project. If it didn't happen on a primary communication tool, discuss wiki issues or GitHub, then it didn't happen. Uh, so if there's something that happens at an in-person meeting or online meeting uh, or in a one-on-one -on -one Skype call or text chat on one of the Slack channels, we want to feed those outcomes and decisions uh, from that discussion into one of the uh, primary tools uh, so that everyone can see it. Uh, speaking of communication tools and channels, uh, after this webinar, you'll be receiving that follow-up email that contains many of the URLs that Harry and I mentioned over the past hour or so. Uh, so please use that email as a launching point for your journey into the Folio project. Uh, so before Harry and I start taking questions, I wanted to call out just two more URLs, uh, and we'll leave these on the screen during the Q&A. Uh, if you want to keep up what's happening with Folios, these two URLs will do it. Uh, the first is for visual and oral learners. Uh, it's the URL to the bi-weekly 60 to 90 minute webinar uh, where the project participants talk about uh, progress on Folio and its sister project, uh, GoKB. The second is for verbal learners. It's the landing page that points to all of the tools that we use in the project. Uh, and at the bottom is a form to sign up for an occasional newsletter email message about the Folio project. And so with that, I think we'll open it up for questions. Great, yeah, this is Mark from ACRL in Choice. We have a few questions already in the hopper, uh, ready to go from folks that have submitted them already. If folks have additional questions, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A box and, uh, We'll get to as many of them as we have time for. Um, so one of the questions that came up a little bit earlier that I thought was an, an interesting one uh, is from Dan. Um, and he asked, are there specific languages or programming skills that are required to dive in and start developing apps? Um, and I just would be curious about your thoughts on that. 
either Harry or Peter? There are not. Uh, part of the design, so we're going to speak a little geek here, uh, is that we're using uh, uh, what's called RESTful uh, interfaces between the apps and the platform. Uh, and so that means that any application that you want to write uh, that speaks HTTP uh, and furthermore uh, obeys the, the, uh, the rules of being a Folio app, uh, no matter what programming language you write it in, uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, hook it up to the, the Folio platform. Uh, that said, there are some tools that we're providing uh, to developers that make it easier at, at the moment for, for Java developers uh, to, do, uh, to uh, uh, create uh, Folio apps. They, they provide these, these, these tools provide the skeleton on which you can hang your, your software development. Um, but there's nothing that says that you can't write something in uh, Python or Visual Basic or uh, if you've got an old Pascal compiler that speaks HTTP somehow, uh, you can use that to uh, uh, hook that, that functionality into the Folio system. Great, thank you. Um, we've got another question here from this one coming in to us from Twitter. Um, and it simply says, cataloging and circulation apps, could these be used for fully digital collections? I don't have a catalog. Could Folio be one? And I don't know if that's more Will you take a stab at that one, Harry? Um, <laughs> or, or sure. <laughs> so um, yes, if if uh, if I remember, so if you do not have a catalog today, um, you don't necessarily need one moving forward with Folio. If you're trying to track and manage strictly e-resources, the fact that it ties in and operates with knowledge bases or existing knowledge bases that exist out there mean you can manage your holdings. At the same time, the flip is, of that is true as well. Um, if you don't manage e-resources and you're only managing a physical book or print collection, you can do that as well and, you know, simply deal with what amounts to a traditional catalog. Um, we believe in most cases 99% of the libraries out there are really looking at a mixture of both. And, of course, you can do that as well. Great. Thank you. That, and that makes sense that they, they would be. Um, we've got a, a question that came through, I think, Harry, when you were presenting from Sharon. And Sharon asks, can you give some examples of organizations or systems that failed to innovate and as a consequence failed or, or disappeared? Um, if you can think of any off the top of your head, um, but if not, that, that's totally fine too. I would just be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, you know, okay. Hey, Go ahead. I was going to say, Harry, I, I saw that question while you were presenting, so I had a little bit of time to think about it. And, and the one that came to mind was uh, uh, video cassette rental services. Uh, and one example of a of a company that that didn't navigate that successfully was Blockbuster. Uh, but one company that did navigate that successfully is Netflix. Uh, Netflix started as a, a service to share. Uh, DVDs through the U.S. mail, uh, and while it still has that as a service, I, its its primary operation now has has changed uh, to uh, uh, to to uh, uh, video streaming services. Uh, and so, you know, I that isn't I, I don't want it to say that that uh, libraries are going away. Uh, but I think libraries are, are challenged to think about how we want our services to be relevant uh, as Netflix has remained relevant and, and not how block, Blockbuster has uh, become irrelevant. Hmm. That, that is an interesting parallel, absolutely. Um, we've got a, another question that came through um, a little earlier. That, that asks, when we put information into Folio, say into the cataloging app, where is that stored? Do I need to have server space to dedicate to Folio and to that data? So 
as far as server space is concerned, we expect Folio will be set up and configured multiple ways. Um, of course, we know there's some organizations that want to install and set up locally. Um, so in those cases, they most likely will need some of that storage space. That said, if they take advantage of a knowledge base that may exist out there that can support holdings remotely, they can be stored there as well. Um, however, we believe in most cases, most organizations will be going to another vendor that's providing hosting services for Folio. And in those cases, I'm not really convinced that you know, storage is necessarily something we'd really be worrying about anymore because really the vendor would be taking care of it. Great, thank you for, for the response. Um, we got a question here from Michael that, that asks, has any thought been given to apps for managing spaces in the library, such as scheduling study room use or, or things of that nature? I think that's a great example of where uh, where the, the platform uh, can be expanded to include something like that. Uh, that isn't on our roadmap right now, uh, but that would be something that I, I could see an independent developer uh, perhaps uh, writing one from scratch or, or perhaps taking one of the ones that is out there uh, in open source right now and uh, adapting it to work in Folio. Great. That, yeah, that's very, very interesting um, to expand the, the sort of range of services. Um, mm -hmm. That's yeah, that's uh, an interesting uh, sort of outcome. We've got one more question. I think we'll make this uh, our last one, unless um, there is objection somewhere, <laughs> you know, somewhere out there. But we're going over a little bit. Um, yeah. We've got one from one last question from uh, Swati, who asks, who says, I want to know if other LMS or discovery service vendors have taken any initiative or shown any interest in testing their systems and whether they can be plugged into Folio. Um, have you had uh, other folks step up and, and uh, start to work on some of this stuff? Peter, you or I? Um, I was trying to remember the name of the company that that uh, that uh, did sign on with Folio Development, but it escapes me at the moment. Well, I'm I'm not going to call out names, but there's actually been a significant number of vendors, really both large and small, um, that we have been hearing from and talking to. Many of them, because it is open source, they've been able to download the code, play with it, build it. And it's usually after they do that when they start to come back and start to ask more questions and think about the possibilities of either integrating it with their co existing code base, providing features, services built around it, and even hosting services as well. And so there is actually a significant amount of interest in that. Um, I expect as time goes on, you'll start to see um, more and more announcements um, in the market. But um, I, I think it's better to leave it at that at the moment. I, yeah, I know there was one. If, if uh, we'd, we'd have to go back to the uh, the folio announcement at ALA Annual um, last year, uh, I just I just can't remember uh, the name of it right now. It's probably on the folio.org website. Great, and it looks like. Um... We've got a list of vendors from the folio.org site that you can find there. Um, I would, as we're wrapping up here, I would just encourage folks to um, let us know how we did. Feel free to uh, click the link for the survey and provide some uh, feedback on the webinar for today. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you very much to, to Harry and Peter for talking with us this afternoon. Um, we'd like to take a moment really to give you a virtual round of applause, a little <laughs> hooray there for a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I would just like to thank everybody else who's on the, uh, the line with us. I'd remind you all as well that we have recorded the program today, so be on the lookout for that follow-up email.
from ACRLN Choice with uh, links to the Folio community resources and a link to the recording. Um, thanks again. I hope everybody has enjoyed the session and, and learned a lot. I hope everybody has an excellent afternoon. Thank you, everyone.